Hello and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Just like the status of threshold nuclear weapon state, to which Iran evidently aspires before the final dash towards the weapon itself, there is apparently a new phenomenon in global diplomacy, a threshold nuclear agreement. With the essentially revoked JCPOA ever closer to a revival but not across the finish line, Iran is surely, but slowly, advancing toward a worrisome capability in several dimensions. This is of course a bargaining tactic, but as time goes by, it has practical consequences which we will attempt to dissect today. Joining us to do so all the way from New York City is Dr. Oli Heinonen, who is the former International Atomic Energy Agency Deputy Director General and a Distinguished Fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Heinonen. Also joining us all the way from Washington, D.C. is Mr. Jason Brodsky, who is the Policy Director at United Against Nuclear Iran. Thank you for joining us as well, Mr. Brodsky. And also with us here in the studio is our TV7 editor at large and host of TV7 Watchmen Talk and Powers in Play and so much more, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, uh, every day we're seeing different developments uh, with regard to the uh, nuclear talks. Of course, uh, there is the European Union's paper, which was tabled by the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Dr. Um, or Mr. Josep Borrell, uh, who is... Uh, an economist by trait, nevertheless, uh, he uh, seeks uh, the diplomat's hat uh, in this constellation uh, to try and, and substantiate non-proliferation. Uh, it seems like uh, the Iranians have, in response, uh, forgone on the whole uh, FTO uh, designation of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. Uh, nevertheless, they're not willing to relent on specifically uh, the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency's probe with regard to uh, nuclear particles that were uncovered in Iran in undeclared uh, facilities, which may have been indeed in breach of uh, the nuclear deal itself, um, something that the Americans have uh, unyieldingly declared that they're not willing to forgo. But, of course, within a political agreement, everything is possible. Uh, what are the latest developments pertaining to this? So um, please allow me uh, to let uh, Oli and Jason uh, enumerate the various uh, kilograms and uh, the timeline uh, needed to uh, translate uh, the uh, uranium uh, accumulated uh, into uh, warheads um, and uh, bombs and, uh, and the rest. And uh, let's concentrate on the meaning of what the Iranians uh, have been doing lately as they are now probably trying to prepare the domestic public opinion to the uh, U-turn in which they will, may, or probably accept um, a, a softer uh, JCPOA from the uh, American uh, point of view. They will not have gotten all of their demands, but nevertheless, they will have to justify it. Uh, and they will do it on economic terms, on what it will do for their very problematic uh, economy. The Iranians want to have uh, all uh, bygones be bygones. Yes, we had uh, some problematic uh, or suspected uh, sites. Uh, let's forget about those. Let's, let's draw the line there and look ahead. Uh, and then we will see regarding the implementation, how soon they are going to get rid and uh, what the mechanism is going to be to get rid of what they have gotten uh, from 2018 on during the four years when the uh, JCPOA uh, was dormant. Are they going to ship it out to Russia or anywhere else? Um, is the inspection regime going to be in place immediately? So uh, there are many, many uh, clauses and many, many uh, um, fine words and fine tuning that we have to see under the headline JCPOA revived. Well, there's nothing comprehensive about this deal at this stage, of right. course. But I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Heinonen. Uh, 
In 2015, uh, one of the, the points that was relayed time and again uh, to everyone was that it's better to have a weak deal than no deal at all. Uh, that was uh, directly uh, spoken of the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Now, when we're talking about this agreement, uh, it's not lengthened, strengthened, or broadened in any way. Uh, it is, uh, unfortunately weaker, shorter, and uh, doesn't have enough credibility because uh, it relies on the word of, of Iran uh, to provide any true clarification to where in uh, the, the uh, timeline is Iran before the breakout point. Is there an ability for the International Atomic Energy Agency, regardless of Iranian statements, to truly provide clarity with regard to Iran's nuclear program? Well, it depends pretty much now from the text, because the way I see this uh, new agreement is that it has two parts. The old JCPOA, which will then be implemented again with the timelines, sunsets as they are aware. But then there is this phase when you enter to implementation of that, which is a separate document which has been apparently negotiated in the last uh, 16, 17, 18 months. And it now depends pretty much what is in that document. In a good case, when I look what Mr. Uh, Grossi mentioned earlier this week in CNN, the IAEA plans still to do the verification of the correctness and completeness of Iran's declarations, find reasons for those uranium particles which have been found in several locations. Some of that indicate materials which IAEA has never seen before in Iran, which means that there is undeclared material, definitely. The way he phrased it is in a way promising if IAEA is allowed to do it, because he talked about the access to the locations, access to the equipment, access to the people, which he has been very hesitant to mention before, but then there was one more word, in access to information. What would be the access to that information? It would be the facilities. The facilities which were built, for example, under the Ahmad program, which were operating, some of them dismantled, some of them not. So if that holds, then the IAEA may get much closer to the status of that nuclear weapons program, which was there once, and what kind of activities has been done since 2003, if it is truthfully implemented. Not implemented as was the PMD dossier in 2015, where it actually didn't matter what the IAEA got as an answer from Iran, answers came, and the board approved that this was enough, and then the P5 plus one endorsed it, and implementation started. So this is an important point, in my view, for the future of nuclear Iran. If we are what want to block its access to nuclear weapons capability or nuclear weapons, this is the time to act and answer those questions which I mentioned. The way I think Mr. Grossi alluded in his presentation to the um, uh, CNN. And one more caveat based on experience. The IAEA has done this before. We did it in uh, 1993 in uh, South Africa, which had a full blown nuclear weapons program. It took one year for the IAEA to certify that that program was dismantled. All the relevant single use weapons related equipment had been destroyed or rendered harmless. And it took one year to do it. In case of Iran, based on the previous uh, uh, knowledge based on the documentation which is over there in the PMD files or in the, those dossiers lifted from uh, Tehran by uh, the, the Israelis. I think that that can be achieved in somewhat shorter time, provided that Iran cooperates. Mm -hmm. So this is a golden opportunity and I hope that the P5-1 sees it Indeed. Well, Mr. Bolsky, I'd like to ask you regarding a, a tweet, a statement uh, that uh, was posted by uh, Mr. Sayed Mohammed uh, Marandi, uh, a 
senior advisor to the Iranian delegation to Vienna, he wrote that uh, uh, he said so for months, but uh, removing the guards from the FTO is not a precondition. Uh, and then he went on to point out uh, something very interesting, and that is that no deal will be implemented before the IAEA board of directors permanently closes the false accusations uh, file, of course, regarding uh, nuclear particles that were uncovered by the International Atomic Energy Agency in Iran in undeclared facilities, something that is, of course, in breach of the 2015 nuclear agreement and other uh, related UN resolutions. Uh, to what degree is this worrying, uh, worrisome? Uh, are we seeing here uh, an equation in which the Iranians will not return into implementation with emphasis on implementation, of course, of the JCPOA unless this happens uh, politically? Well, uh, yes, I think it raises a concern because I think that there's a distinction between Iran uh, agreeing to the EU final text uh, and also al along with the uh, understanding that the safeguards probe uh, would continue, uh, but uh, Iran is also threatening not to implement, uh, according to uh, Iranian officials' uh, commentary, uh, the JCPOA if the uh, safeguards probe is not closed. Now, Iran's long history of stonewalling the IAEA and the agency uh, on uh, this matter is uh, definitely a cause uh, for concern. It ha has not provided technically credible answers on multiple occasions. Roadmaps, multiple roadmaps have been issued, and uh, yet here we still are. So uh, I do think that this uh, safeguards probe, even if the agreement is announced, uh, this safeguards probe is going to continue to haunt uh, the process in the implementation. Mr. Oren, uh, even though we heard here in uh, Israel a number of senior officials or former senior officials because the official policy is against uh, the nuclear agreement with Iran, uh, we heard the former officials saying time and again, uh, look, we are for an agreement. Uh, however, there is a caveat here. They were for an agreement in order to provide enough time for the Israeli defense establishment and military in particular to build up its forces for the inevitable conflict that would ultimately happen uh, between the Islamic Republic of Iran and Israel, something of course not mentioned in the various briefings uh, by uh, the State Department Secretary, uh, Press Secretary Ned Price and, and others within the U.S. Uh, establishment and elsewhere. Is this now uh, the equation? Is a war with Iran inevitable, regardless of a nuclear deal or not? Well, my interpretation is somewhat different than yours, uh, which is uh, to say uh, it's the complete opposite. Literal. Um, no, not only, not only that. Um, in 2015, the Israeli defense establishment, the uh, general staff of the uh, IDF, Mossad and the others, were for the JCPOA, they preferred it to having uh, no deal at all. And they wanted to use the time from 2015 or 2016 on in order to build up the Israeli Defense Forces for other contingencies, not against Iran, because they believed that the Iranian problem has been put off until the late 2020s. It may rise again towards 2030 and the sunset uh, clauses, but they wanted to use the, the time not for uh, another preparation against Iran, but rather for, for different uh, contingencies. Now, within the Israeli uh, establishment now, you can hear the nuances. Prime Minister Lapid and the alternate prime minister who is retiring from politics, Naftali Bennett, are basically echoing the policy of former pri prominent Prime Minister Netanyahu. Whether they actually believe um, um, in the same idea or whether they are afraid to, uh, uh, to have him attack them if they seem to be acquiescent with the uh, American policy uh, is immaterial. They sound exactly like Netanyahu. Defense Minister Gantz, however, who was the uh, chief of staff up until January 2015 and was against an Israeli operation uh, in Iran is more moderate. He has, for operational reasons, though. He, not only that, he has not come out for an agreement 
yet, but he is not uh, uh, militant against the agreement, and so is uh, his successor as chief of staff, Gadi Eisenkot, who has now joined him as his uh, political associate. Uh, so it is not only former Israeli defense officials uh, who would rather have this agreement revived than uh, no agreement, and uh, most of them echo the Biden administration uh, by saying that the four years since President Trump and Secretary Pompeo came out with their maximum pressure policy have been detrimental for the Israeli uh, preparedness against Iran. You were referring, of course, to the change from the acquisition of an entire submarine fleet, which is a second response uh, capability, uh, which then diverted uh, significant funds into more of kinetic uh, uh, land force no, no, capabilities. Not, not, not necessarily. The, the, uh, the six uh, submarines, because uh, there will never be nine submarines. Whenever a new submarine comes into the fleet, an old and obsolescent one leaves. Uh, the, uh, the money would have gone to practicing long-range uh, flights, strikes into Iran. Of course, there's cyber, there are other means, but uh, the money would have gone to such preparations, which every year, when you don't use them, um, it's money gone down the drain. Indeed. Well, uh, nonetheless, we're dealing with uh, a nuclear uh, program, which is rapidly progressing. And I'd like to ask you, Dr. Heinonen, uh, where, within the context of, of this program, where do you think Iran currently is? Is it already a nuclear threshold state? Is it able to assimilate all of the various components and build a, a arsenal of, of nuclear payloads that then uh, it could utilize on surface-to-surface -surface, uh, components uh, that uh, would, you know, delivery systems that could reach uh, Israel and even the outskirts of Europe? There are several definitions what is a break uh, out uh, state, but the most common use is just the capability to produce high-end uranium weapons grade in certain period of time. And in the case of Iran, today with the centrifuge is installed and available, stocks of already enriched uranium, it is a matter of weeks when they have, can have enough 90% uh, enriched uranium for first nuclear weapon. That's a fact and it has been endorsed even by the Biden administration. Then how long it will take to manufacture the actual nuclear weapon for the warhead? That's hard to say because we have a lot of uncertainties. We don't know to which degree they have continued, as was planned at the end of the AMAD program, the design and um, uh, development activities related to the weapon design. They were supposed to be overt activities and covert activities, as the archives of, uh, uh, brought from uh, Tehran show. They set it up. There are three institutions which were involved. They have been operating. People who were part of the program, like Apasi Davani, Fraxisade, Puzurede, uh, etc., they went and worked on those institutes. But we don't know what they were doing. That's one thing. Then the nuclear component, the uranium metal. Iran had that experience already in uh, 2003. They were close to 100, 200 kilograms of uranium metal. They don't need these tiny experiments which have now been in the limelight in the last uh, few couple of years. So they have that know-how. So then it's, for me, it's a pretty much of the will. When you plan to go, which way you go, and how you are able to man maintain the secrecy that you have time to do it. And this will be very compartmentalized project. It will be difficult to find. It will be a surprise to intelligence because even though there is an intrusion to their security system, this may not be in entirely known where they are, where they manufacture this. And that's why this IAEA probe is important also to see how far they might have got on those activities, which could be the preparation for nuclear breakout. Indeed. Mr. Blotsky, I'd like to hear your take on this, but beyond that also, if uh, uh, you will, uh, 
To what degree, uh, as someone who closely follows and monitors everything that's coming out of Iran, um, are the Iranians in a state of mind of pursuing a nuclear weapon, considering the fact that they are spending billions and billions of dollars at the expense of the welfare of their people into a program that they are supposed now to cut back on just in order to reach a deal? Something doesn't make sense here. Well, I think Iran has a nuclear hedging strategy uh, that it employs, and uh, I think that the system uses the nuclear program as a way to extort the international community for concessions. Uh, and uh, one of the concerns that I had with the JCPOA and its revival is that uh, the uh, agreement itself is used as a shield by Iran to prevent accountability for its non-nuclear malign behavior. And those are the real crown jewels of the system, the drone program, the missile program, uh, its support for terrorism and proxies. So the nuclear program it has used successfully as a distraction uh, for and a cover for its other malign behavior. And the international community has not been able to come up with a comprehensive Iran strategy that tackles all of these components and pushes back on them uh, at the same time. And uh, that so, so the system is using the nuclear program in this way as a, as a distraction and, tr and as a way to extort concessions from the uh, international community. Dr. Heinonen, the last uh, time you came on the program, uh, roughly two weeks ago, uh, you mentioned also a, a new angle that needs to be monitored, and that is of uh, Iran, China, uh, Russia, North Korea, uh, and uh, you mentioned uh, a certain um, unhealthy equilibrium in that. Uh, Syria was also mentioned, of course. What uh, can you tell us about uh, this uh, new equilibrium that uh, you mentioned, and what are the true dangers that uh, raise your concern? Well, my concerns were basically technical nature. From that point of view that I see the scientific cooperation, particularly proceeding with the North Korea, following pretty much the model with Syria had in early 2000s with uh, North Korea when they started to built the al Kipar and went ahead with the nuclear reactor designs. So that is the major concern. And Russia uses this, perhaps not contributing, but as a leverage in its relation with, with the US and its leverage in negotiating some easier provisions for the JCPOA entering agreement in order to keep uh, U.S. engaged more and more with Iran and giving leeway for Russia to operate, for example, in Ukraine. So U.S. gets defo uh, defocused. And perhaps something similar happens between uh, China and North Korea. So I don't think that Chinese want North Koreans to have nuclear weapons, but they may want to have this problem over there which takes a lot of energy from the U.S. and uh, has also certain disturbance effects in the in the international community and the support which U.S. can get to its uh, work with uh, and containing of uh, Iranian aspirations. So it's a complex equation. Indeed, Dr. Botsky uh, or Mr. Botsky, would you like to uh, uh, provide some uh, insight into your perspective to this? Well, I, I, I agree with those comments, uh, and I would say that, uh, you know, I think, the, again, I would emphasize the broader picture here is important. Iran is not just a nuclear file, and uh, we, we need to be looking at the precedent that going back into the JCPOA uh, sets. And I am concerned by the reports that I read that non-nuclear sanctions relief will be exchanged for a shorter and weaker uh, nuclear deal. And that eliminates options and tools for the United States to push back effectively on Iran's behavior in an expansive manner. So uh, that would be the point I wanted to add. Mr. Owen, I'd like to hear your take, uh, but also one ingredient into it. I hear from uh, top 
security officials and, and military people um, that uh, this agreement is a prelude that could lead to a regional war. Is this something that raises your concern? Regional war only if Iran sees it um, as um, having a more flexible uh, room for maneuver, encouraging Hezbollah to uh, strike the Israeli gas uh, derricks in the uh, Mediterranean, and that could indeed lead uh, to war between Israel and Iran's proxy without Iran being directly involved. But let me add uh, a couple of points. Uh, regarding what um, uh, Dr. Heinonen said earlier about South Africa, indeed, uh, I would like to support uh, uh, his idea because uh, we later found out from uh, Prime Minister de Klerk that the South Africans already had six bombs, uh, which uh, they had to dismantle. This is not the case uh, with Iran. However, if we talk about uh, deception and denial or deception through denial, uh, we are looking uh, at dictators. Uh, the Koreans, the North Koreans, may have announced that they are um, a nuclear weapon state before they were. Saddam Hussein uh, indicated that he had uh, nuclear weapons before he had. And maybe the uh, Iranians will come out uh, one day and announce that they have reached the uh, nuclear weapon stage before they did and challenge the world to find out if they are or are not. Or maybe they don't declare anything and they actually already have some. Uh, we will uh, not know unless uh, the IAEA manages to attain some vigorous uh, scrutiny over Iran's nuclear program. But this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Dr. Oli Heinonen, Mr. Uh, Jason Brodsky, and uh, Mr. Amir Oren for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time.